In my last video, I talked about how I needed to edge band a whole bunch of melamine because I was building a whole new set of cabinets for the workshop. These are the cabinets, five uppers, five downers, base cabinets, 20 drawers, two tool trays, and I guess technically you could call this a miter saw station, but I'm not going to do that because a miter saw is a sometimes tool, it just needs somewhere to go, and the real star of the show is all of this storage. But Paul, you already had cabinets, why would you bother spending all that time and money making new ones? Well, the previous ones weren't working exactly how I wanted them to. They had to have lots of little retrofits to make them work how I need them in this workshop. Plus after two household moves, they'd gotten a little bit dinged up. So sort of a celebration of being in the new place, I wanted to make something that looked nice and functioned better and was built higher quality. As it turns out, I didn't know what I was doing when I made them the last time. I wanted them to look nicer, but these don't look nice at all. They're just white boxes, cabinets and no, no doors or drawer fronts. That's true. In this video, I'm going to be focusing on building the cabinets, the drawers and the miter saw stop. And in the next video, I'm going to be building the drawer fronts and doors as well as painting them. First time I've done any sort of HVLP stuff. This is Still in progress, I need to put a second coat on uh, a little bit later today. But trust me, it's gonna look a lot better than what I had. Wait, you just built these rather than buying them? They're basic white cabinets. Well, why would you do that? Cost, basically, and I could get exactly what I wanted. Well, it doesn't sound like there'd be a lot of savings in building cabinets over buying. I can go into a cost-benefit analysis if people are interested, but Roughly speaking, if you include the machines that I bought to help me in this project, or I justified using this project, uh, I saved more than half. Uh, and if you don't include that, it's almost a third, maybe a quarter of the price of buying the same sort of cabinet. So it was worth the time to me. If you are interested in that breakdown of the material costs versus buying something off the shelf, let me know. I'll pop that in the next video. This applies to pretty much all sheet goods, but especially to chipboard backed melamine. The edge quality on all of the manufactured edges is hot garbage. Uh, this doesn't ultimately matter. Um, the sheet is made oversized, so it's a 1.2 by 2.4 meter sheet, but the actual dimensions are about anywhere from 15 to 25 millimeters more than that, which means that there's plenty of room to cut off those crappy edges. If I'm being charitable, I don't know the real reason for why it's done, but if I'm being charitable, I would say that that means there's a little bit of allowance in transportation and manufacturing. So if it's damaged in those cases, transport and manufacturing, it doesn't actually affect the end product because I can just chop it off. So that's what I'm doing is I'll, on all the sheets, is taking off the first five, 10 mil on one edge, then I'll base all my track saw cuts off that. Then when it comes time to taking these rough blocks down into the final dimensions of the table saw. First, I will rip off whatever the garbage edges are and then cut to the actual dimensions. My cut lists are all based on the size that I want, 2.4 by 1.2. Uh, so I'm not accounting for having that little bit extra, which means that I have that little bit extra to actually cut off. I'm not sure how clear that's gonna be on video. This is the cut surface, this is the factory edge. It's much rougher. Maybe I'd actually hear it. Nice and smooth. It's very grabby along the way because it's just not smooth. As I'm rough breaking down the sheets, I label each section with their sheet number and section letter. Cut lines marked on blue tape stop it wiping off easily like it does directly on melamine. sizes are cut on the table saw, ideally cutting all pieces that would have a common dimension at once so the fence doesn't have to change. Some parts need to be split from their rough size before batching out to the final dimension. Now 
row parts are cut to the length using the crosscut sled and a similar batching technique so the stop block doesn't need to move. When batching out all these parts, the biggest lifesaver was my little shop cart, so I had a somewhat of an ergonomic workflow so I didn't need to move more than one step away from the saw. This same cart got a good workout moving parts from the saw over to the workbench so I could move on to the next batch. Before the next stage of dados, drilling and assembly, the relevant parts were all edge banded. I have a standalone video covering edge banding and trimming. single blade width dado was all that's needed for the back panels. Those panels are just 3mm MDF with melamine on one side. So the idea is that this fence has set the depth. It is 8mm away from the edge of the material. That's half the thickness of the material, so it's a perfect spot for the screw to go in. But what about along this way? Well, I could just try to get around the melamine. Instead, I'm going to use some masking tape and essentially create a story stick here. So can mark on here, okay, let, let's pretend this is 50 millimeters here, another 50 there. So perhaps I line the edge of that part up there and then I can actually drill. I'll know that's in eight millimeters down 50 millimeters for this part. I'll batch out all the parts of the one size at once so that I can just take the tape off, put a new piece down for the next part. This drill press has an auto start mode, which is pretty great for batching out so many holes. The keen eyed amongst you may have noticed that I used this step bit rather than perhaps the more traditional on YouTube pocket hole bit because I'm not using pocket holes. I was drilling straight through because I'm not gonna be using pocket holes. This is the recommended screw size for pocket holes in this material. This is a 5 eighths of an inch or 16 millimeter thick melamine. You'd use a one inch or 25 millimeter screw. It's not a lot of screw. Using this bit going straight through, I can use much longer screws. In fact, I'll be using this Confirmat, Confirmat Director. There are a few different names, not sure how they're pronounced. Screw, it's, it's way bigger. It's really neat. And I could, I wanted to give it a shot. These screws are meant to be much better in sheet goods and they can be removed successfully without destroying material. Whereas if you use a regular wood screw, quite often in melamine, if you remove the screw, you would have to drill another hole because it'll just destroy it on the way out. So it's another reason that I'm giving these chunkier Confirmat screws a shot. Another thing to point out between these two screws is that the pocket hole screw has a point on it as self-drilling, whereas the Confirmat, Director, whatever it is, screw is not. It's nice and blunt on the end. Means you can brute force the pocket hole screw through. You just need a small pilot hole. It'll do the rest. Confirmat screws, not so much. You need to have the matching profiles. Hopefully you can see that the drill bit matches the size of the screw. It has nice straight cutter, I suppose, for the uh, shank of the screw then when we get to the head end there is another cutter for the widened head and then finally the very tip of the head in this case it's a phillips head uh, so this will sit just slightly underneath the surface of the melamine so there's enough room to put a cap on it if we want to and as a side note this stop on it is not something that came with it i've added that on so that's why it doesn't look perfectly concentric in video format because it's not the inside of the upper cabinets will receive a 5mm hole for shelf pins. Just like before, a story stick for drilling, this time three holes per side. I don't really need infinite shelves. And yes, on this one cabinet side, I put them on the outside, not the inside, by mistake. Assembly for the cabinets is pretty straightforward. Um, there's a left and right side panel, top and bottom, which they're interchangeable, and a back panel. I'm going to be using a nail gun, a 23 gauge 
pin nailer to just uh, tack things in place while I can get everything aligned for the screws. That way nothing shifts on me when I actually drive the screws and it's a little bit quicker than using clamps. The previously drilled holes now need to be extended into the matching pieces. The uppers receive back support that doubles as a cleat. An angle is cut into the back support. The cleat can then be attached with screws. By being recessed into the cabinet, the cabinet can sit flush up against the wall. Sort of. You'll see what I mean. And mounting these cabinets is not particularly exciting viewing, so that's why I haven't gone into great detail. The TLDR version is that it because of these piers on the wall, they're a brick uh, thick out from the wall, it meant mounting the cabinets inside or flush up against the wall was going to be tricky. If I ended up doing that, they've got a, I've got a conduit going up there, I've got a solar inverter just over there, so nothing would line up all that well. Instead of going on the face of the piers, I've got two stretches, or well, four stretches, two ro uh, rows of stretches that the cleats are actually mounted onto. The stretchers are attached with, I think they're like 160 kilo rated screws uh, into the masonry, so it's all pretty hunky-dory. The matching cleat on the back on the inside of the cabinet. This guy here will mount, or meet up with that piece there. It gives me a little bit of real room as that's a little bit narrower than the cabinet itself, but not too much. Then these will all get clamped together. You might be able to see that some of these are already clamped. I can screw them all together. Took great care to uh, level the stretches and then the cleats themselves. And then there wasn't really any leveling work needed to be done on the cabinets themselves. Slots in like so. Grab a clamp pulls it into alignment, grab another clamp, that pulls that one into alignment, and then I can screw through and uh, more permanently attach all the cabinets to themselves. Then later on will come doors. The base cabinets are assembled pretty much the same way as the upper cabinets are. Two side panels, we have a base panel, uh, there's a stretcher on the back here. The only difference really is it's got two stretches. The reason for doing this rather than a full panel is mostly weight and cost. No one is ever going to see that a full size panel, you're adding in more weight, more cost of material, and it doesn't particularly add any more strength. Uh, the top that sits on top of everything hides everything visually and provides enough rigidity. Base cabinets are just boxes. They'll sit on top of a plinth, which provides somewhere to attach feet, somewhere to level, and provides the inset for the toe kick. I'll be making two plinths, one for two cabinets and one for three cabinets. The assembly process is pretty similar to the cabinets themselves. Tack it together with nails, then screw together. There is the outside box, then on the inside these L pieces made up of two stretches to provide the strength and rigidity. These L pieces also provide a space for the feet to attach to. These plastic cabinet feet provide plenty of weight bearing and adjustability for levelling. They're also pretty cheap. Feet are in two pieces, the bracket and the foot itself. And levelling the cabinets is where the plinths really shine. Rather than having four feet on each cabinet and having to reach all the way underneath the cabinet to adjust the 
feet on it to get it all level. I can just level the plinth, that will do three cabinets, check it across it, check it front to back. Really easy to access because I can just get my hand in and adjust from on top. Took about five minutes to do both plinths. All I did was uh, raise the middle feet up, put the level at base on the outside feet, and then I could just lower the middle ones to give extra support. So definitely recommend it. This will also mean that there's no uh, wood contacting the ground, it's all those plastic feet. So no moisture is gonna come up into the melamine and destroy it over time. I have to get a fair bit of flooding in here, which would destroy quite a few other things before I have to worry about water ingress causing any issues. Now you're probably all familiar with measure twice, cut once, which it's, it's fine, but have you heard of measure not any times and instead use a series of spaces that don't all have to be the same size, but in this case they are, and instead of cutting, do drilling because it's draw slide install in time. It's derived from a Welsh word, that's a backronym, that explains the system of installing draw slides. It, it's pretty self-explanatory. I have 20 something draw slides to install, which again, I could measure everything, but that would be really annoying to do. Instead using these spaces, in this case it is evenly spaced spaces, they're 150 mil pieces of scrap plywood. They're stacked on top of each other, then clamped in so it can't fall down. The cabinet side of the drawer slide just gets butted up against that and a really neat clamp called gravity holds it in position vertically. So I don't have to fight that, it's not gonna tilt on me, which is again why I've got all these spaces. I'm gonna pop a couple of screws in uh, just to hold it up, then I can always put some more screws in. Yeah, you know, I find that getting through the melamine layer with just an impact driver, it can be done, but you have to apply a fair bit of pressure, so you end up skewing where everything is sitting, which is defeating the purpose of using the spaces in the first place. So pre-drilling or drilling a pilot hole is just a couple of mil deep, just through that melamine layer makes the process go a whole lot smoother. The only thing to be aware of with what screws you use is what head they have. If they have a truss head, they're pretty much good to go. They're nice and low profile, or you can use the uh, Euro screw, as they're commonly referred to. These guys here, which have a very tiny head on them, uh, just a flat countersunk head. If you use a regular wood screw, it may be too large and protrude, stopping the sliding mechanism from, well, sliding. Drawer boxes go together similar to the cabinets. That is, just tack things in place, drill through the pre-drilled holes, then drive in the screws. The 16mm thick base is just screwed in, no rabbit or dado. Thinner material could have been used, but plywood bases in melamine drawers would look kind of strange. Or if I went too thin and used the 3mm melamine faced MDF, that would create a terribly flexible drawer bottom that would likely pop out of the dado. The sides are the full length of the drawer, so while you'll see the chipboard edges for now, that will get covered up with a drawer front. Installing the slide on the drawer box is even easier than on the cabinet side. Place the drawer slide and drawer box on a flat surface, clamp a block to the front, but the drawer slide up against that block and screw it in. There's no need to mount it anywhere but the bottom of the box. The top will be a solid wood laminated panel from Bunnings. Being solid wood, it's best to attach it using screws through oversized holes in the cabinet stretches to avoid any wood movement issues. The gap between both banks of cabinets is where the miter saw will sit. This needs to be spaced down to allow the bed of the miter saw to be level with the cabinet tops. Using the spacer, some brackets are screwed into the cabinets. A section of the bench top can be placed onto two brackets, then the miter saw on top of that. I'm going for a no-fence miter saw station, but I still want to be able to have repeatable cuts with the stop block. To that end, I'm going to dado in some T-track so that the T-track will sit slightly below the surface of the bench top. This is done over multiple passes. First, figure out the depth, then the width. Using the T-track itself, I can test whether it fits or not and adjust the fence rather than measuring.
With a good snug fit from routing, the T-Track needs some slight encouragement to pop into the dado. Using a T-block and some percussive help, it really barely needs screws. For the stop locks, I'm trying to use up some random scraps that made it to the new house. With it cut to width, I can cut a shallow, narrow dado that will receive a key. The key is cut from some other scrap material and matches the size of the opening of the T-Track. Since it was safer to use a longer piece initially, I have plenty of room to chop this into two stop blocks. Each stop block gets a through hole for the threaded rod for the flip arm. In this case, an 8mm hole for M8 threaded rod. They also receive a through hole for the locking bolt. This is a 5 16 of an inch hole to match the T-track. With the bolt in place for spacing, a few dabs of CA glue to act as clamps is used, while the PVA can set up to hold the keys in place. These keys will stop the block from rotating when tightened down. These keys are the same as before, just shortened with a handsaw. The stop block sits over a T-bolt and the key nestles into the T-track. M8 threaded rod is inserted through the hole with a washer and lock nut. The flip arm is just another scrap with a hole drilled for the 8mm threaded rod. Another washer and lock nut lock it all the way down and allow me to adjust tension on the arm so it doesn't flop around. You won't really notice it, but I did apply a couple of coats of a water-based top coat. It hasn't changed the colour of it, but it does make cleanup a little bit easier. It's not really going to protect the wood much more than it being raw, but uh, dust wipes down clearer. So if you notice a little bit more of a sheen than before, that's why. I'll eventually add some scale tape uh, underneath the stops here, so I know what length I'm actually cutting, but I just haven't found any to buy yet, so that's why I haven't. These blocks otherwise work fantastic. Nice rock solid, uh, and there's two of them. What more can I say? In the space behind the cabinets between the two pillars of the wall, uh, it's quite a quite a void that things could fall down in. Eventually, I'll add some sort of shelf. Um, I guess you could call it like a splashback or a pediment. Uh, so I'll have one piece going vertical, one horizontal. That'll give me a bit of shelf space and stop things from falling down there. But I haven't done that yet. I'm stoked to have all of this storage in one spot. It means that I don't have things all over the workshop and I can concentrate them in one section, free up more floor space because I'm not trying to store things everywhere. And more, more than that, I'm excited to have it almost done. I have the cabinet doors and drawer fronts. Uh, they need another coat or two, but here's a sneak peek of one of the doors. I'm loving the color. It's a uh, towering pine from Haynes paint paints and I'm very excited to have that splash of color and personalization in here but I think more than that I'm excited that I'm that much closer to doing some actual woodworking. Cabinetry is very skilled don't get me wrong and I don't mean this is in a negative way but cabinetry is adjacent to woodworking there's a lot of overlap of skills but at the end of the day it's not the sort of woodworking that I like to do it's its own thing uh, and I'm okay at it at best, maybe a little bit better at woodworking than I am cabinetry. So I'm very excited to make some proper sawdust very, very soon. And with these cabinets that close to being done, I'm that one step closer. Thanks for watching.